first um, plenary session, we want to have one person working on electricity market and one person working on climate change just to set up a little bit the background for this conference. Because one aim of this conference is to stick together people from the community of, of in academics working in electricity market and people from the community of um, in environmental resource economics. And we, were, we are very pleased that Lucas accepted to uh, talk about climate change. So uh, Lucas is professor at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, in which, in where he holds a share in economics. He is well known in this community of environmental and resource economists because uh, one reason is that he has been elected president of the European Association of Environmental Resource Economists that shows his uh, popularity among, among, among us. He's also organizing, for this reason, he's organizing the next conference of the association in Zurich, so should submit the paper by uh, January, I think. Lucas has been, has been very productive in publishing papers in several topics related to climate change, resource use, uh, growth, taxation, and public policy. And, and uh, he not only has a very active career as an economist in the academics, but also involved in uh, many uh, climate negotiations. That's one reason we also want to have his view on climate change. He was part of uh, the Swiss delegation uh, in uh, many COP uh, conferences, uh, COP 15, 17, 20, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you for this kind invitation. Thank you for the kind presentation, Stefan. So, uh, indeed, I'm talking about climate policy, talk about efficient aspects and the equitable aspects of climate policy. And I think, well, as an economist, we are well used to efficiency. That's what we are doing all the time. But the public actually is not so much about efficiency, it's much about equity. So people are concerned about inequalities. People are concerned about the different countries. And this is why when we come out of academics, what we produce as results is not really well received, not directly received. For example, as we heard it at the COP, uh, the conference of the parties, we have to speak another language. We have to find different solutions. And this is what it's all about. So, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking here as an academic. I know uh, what the optimal solutions are in, in our models. But on the other hand, uh, I also know what the delegations are thinking, how they are reacting, how they are dealing with each other. And indeed, I will be also in Paris at the end of the year, and we very much hope that the big challenge that we heard from Jean Tirole will be somehow addressed adequately. I mean, uh, there's lots of reasons for be being pessimistic, but. Uh, there's also some maybe brighter uh, aspects of it, and let's, let's talk about it. So what is the uh, public uh, perception? Uh, people think, well, we do have a problem out there. Something is wrong. Most people would think, well, it is. So what are we doing? We, we use politics. We use policy, and uh, we have them. Uh, we have the lovely lady in the middle, and we have these uh, guys around with suits and ties, and they will take care of it. So this is what should be done. They actually promise to do something, and economists have the solution. We know that this is an externality. We have uh, some external cost with the use of fossil fuels. We should levy a tax. We should have a pigouvin tax to uh, remove this external cost. We go to the optimal solution, and then either we have the tax or we, we restrict the quantity to uh, reach the two degrees Celsius target, and that's what should be done. Now. Why is it not yet happening? Well, it says, for example, Paul Krugman said in his uh, New York Times column, well, what we need now is the political will. But this political will just does not arise automatically. It doesn't happen. And I want to ask now what, what's wrong with it and what, what are the real issues? And I think we can, from the economic side, we can contribute more to, to solve this. So the real world, not surprisingly, is much more complex. So first of all, we have a growing world economy. And actually, people don't really think in static terms. They're very much like the dynamics. So leading economists, they are worried that their growth rates will go down, that they're no longer competitive. And the lagging economists, they're really worried that they can catch up. 
that they can converge, that they have higher living standards. So I think we should address the main issues by, by dynamic models. Secondly, we have a highly divide, a divided world. We have rich and poor countries. You see these uh, red spots, these are the rich countries. We have uh, other countries which are relatively low income. And also, we have a diversity of countries uh, in terms of vulnerability. Uh, very often, and uh, it's unfortunate that many of the poor economies are highly vulnerable to climate change. Thirdly, we have the predictions of natural sciences. And there you see that we have, of course, uh, again, the long run which is a problem itself. The damages will only occur in the long run. And we have uncertainties involved. How to deal with these uncertainties in a rational manner? So I have some more complexities added here. So we need to think in terms of dynamics. We think in long term. We have to deal with these uncertainties everywhere. We have to think about, and this is now really about this divided world in equity, uh, in equity terms. This international dimension, north-south aspects, very important. We think about other issues like uh, well, how, how should development look like in general? How should population be uh, counted in? Then also topics which are not so close to economics, but also are very important. What about uh, our lifestyle? What, what should we change if we want to be successful and address the challenge? And then also in the end, uh, what are the good institutions to address our things? Uh, how, do we have enough time to do this? Uh, what about our institutions? What about United Nations? It's, it's not the best institution, I would argue. So there's many, many reasons for the lack of political will at the moment. It, was, it reminded me of Hercules, you know. I mean, it's, it's so difficult to get it done. So if you think of the legend of, uh, if you think of the Herculean task, Hercules had 12 labors to do, all of them very difficult, very bloody, by the way. But, uh, and in the end, he was successful. He succeeded. He could do it. So it was then. And what now? Well, you see, I was also sitting there in Copenhagen at the end. Actually, I, I, I stopped sitting after a while, and I took the night train going back, and I was stuck in northern Germany with minus 10 degrees Celsius. It was not, had to wait for three hours. So it was not pleasant. So what about, what's the difference for Paris? How can we do, uh, how can we make this uh, Eiffel Tower shine in the end? I want to address it by research and policy questions that we have now, uh, given our models, given our experience. What is it in the climate policy, what is so specific that is so difficult to implement? How can we address these equity issues? How do we do this burden sharing? It's, it's crucial. Uh, maybe as economists we should also contribute to this part. How can we link it to general issues that people might have about development, about population, whatever? And what are we uh, exposed to, supposed to do in, in, in our contributions as uh, specific? And I would argue it's, in, in, it's going in three directions. We should get first our efficiency issues right. I don't think that everywhere in climate economics we are very clear. And maybe some results are missing even. So we have to think about these dynamic issues. Then we should clearly separate, as we usually do in economics, we should say what is really efficiency, what is equity, because in general debate, it's all mixed up. And it's basically 90% equity and 10% efficiency, and we have to say clearly what is what. And then in the end, we should also come up with some solutions for the equity issue. And I just wanted to, uh, well, tell you that, in fact, this climate negotiator, they would love to have a party in Paris. But what they really fear, what they're really afraid of, is the national parliaments, the national lobbies, the national government. So it is nothing special about this international frame. People come together, they think international, they meet, you meet people from countries you don't even know that they exist. So it's really exciting, but in the end, people think in national frames. They go back to their governments and they're afraid and they're afraid of their lobbies. So it's 200 times national policy and this makes it really, really cumbersome. So my proposition through the general talk will be the following. I think that the political will, which is lacking or has been lacking so far, will grow or will be increasing when we stress the dynamic impacts of this uh, climate policies, because climate policies are considered to be costly. So we should show, uh, we should show also in quantitative terms what it means for the growth rates and for development. We should deal with uncertainty in a rational way, and I can also mention then what, what I think is a not rational way to be uh, dealing with uncertainty. We should uh, propose something which people consider to be fair. We should consider these international asymmetries, and we should also, uh, well, keep this whole debate about sustainably focused. If we're diluting it in too many messages, we will not be successful in the end. 
So the topics here, I want to talk first about the cost of the climate policy, and I want to link it to the resource economics literature and the growth literature, because I think it's, it's really crucial for a long-term topic. Then I want to talk about climate models that we're using. So what, what is the impact on climate change in our growth models? What is the role of uncertainty if we do it uh, uh, correctly? Then I want to change gears and talk about uh, uh, equi uh, equitable burden sharing and north-south perspectives. And in the end, I will have some uh, further topics if time permits to talk about them. Now, in general, we are all agreeable that we should have good models to base our recommendations. We should be basing our policy recommendations on suitable models. If you look at climate, at the climate economics uh, field, then you see that we have many, many numerical simulation models. And this is fully okay. I mean, this is, is fine. But in fact, people argue, well, it's so complex. Uh, economics is complex and, and the, the ecology is complex, so we, we need a complex model. And in fact, in economics, also financial markets, international economics, everything is complex. And what we used to do is to reduce it that we can see what are the main intuitions. Do we get it right, more or less, or are we completely wrong? So whenever we have some, some kind of doubts, whether these numerical simulation models give us something which is useful, we should go back to theory and see what is really, uh, what, what, is, what, what is a keen result, what, what can we use, which is robust in terms of, uh, well, of policy conclusion. So I would argue that we should, of course, include economic dynamics and we should also include uncertainty into this uh, theoretical modeling. This is one of the examples where, where these dynamic uh, aspects come in. Uh, when you talk about cost of climate policy, people are really afraid that it's too costly. It's, they all said, in principle, we would like to do it, but you know, in, in political terms and just now, and then we have a recession, a euro crisis, and it doesn't work now. So what they think, in what negotiators understand, and what policymakers understand, are the level effects. And they basically what they're using is something like a, a growth accounting. They say less input, less output, and nothing else happens. It's partial, it's static, no dynamics, no interrelations between the variables, no sectors. And all these things are so crucial, and there, of course, you need a model to find out how robust it is. So the level effects are, of course, there. You cannot deny them. There is a cost. If you reduce an input such important as fossil fuels, of course, you get, in, in, in you get less output. On the other hand, you have a dynamic effect, you have a dynamic impact on the economy, and this has to be taken into account correctly. So what we focus on is in, in endogenous capital formation, because we know that in the long run, the economy is driven by capital. So we have also to look at innovation, how much uh, innovation is induced by uh, reducing fossil fuel input. Uh, these growth effects might counteract the level of, actually in most models I've been working with, it, it's, it's the case, but then we, we cannot say they're completely offsetting or uh, that we have to, to, to be clear how much is counteracted by the growth effects. And to find out this, we, we can link it, which has uh, not, not often been done, to the very old resource economics literature, because also there you have increasing resource prices, according to the hoteling rule, you know, that the, that the prices increase over time. Here we want to make them increase by policy, and or maybe we can couple the, the two, and then we want to uh, know what is the impact on capital formation, on capital accumulation. And this is all the old capital resource models, but there is also, of course, modern, modern versions of it. As an illustration of the uh, level effect and the growth effect, you see here uh, the log utility. And then you can, of course, uh, well, uh, if, if you integrate this, you see that you have an effect here, and you have an effect on G, so this is the consumption. You integrate over time with a discount rate a row. And then you see that uh, the climate policy has an impact on instantaneous consumption, but also an impact on the growth rate. And these two things are linked by input use, so it might be that if you have something which gives a shift from consumer sector to the capital sector, you will get a higher growth rate. And of course, to get the growth effect right, you have to calculate this and see what the result is. In general, what is also, I mean, we have the resource use, the hoteling, but we also have pollution. So how much is it really in, in terms, of, well, what does it cost in, in dynamic terms to redirect the polluting economy? What people have in mind and what they uh, constantly are, uh, well, reminded of is, well, we, we had these oil price jumps, you know, in the 70s. Most of us, no, not most, but many of us remember. So this was the first, then it was the second. And now we have this interesting period between 2003 and 2008. And then people would say, well, all after these periods, we had a recession. So it cannot be that a high oil price is something which is good for the economy. It is actually, it's bad for the economy. But here you have to be careful. 
I, I want to argue that the level effect is completely different from the growth effect. And basically, level effects here are business cycle effects in the long run, in the short run. Of course, in the short run here, if you triple prices overnight, then of course, what can you do in the economy? You cannot adjust. But even in, well, already in the second, in, in the last period here, these were five years, and the, the world economy was booming at the same time. And interestingly, in the end, it was hit by a financial crisis. It was not the high oil price which made it collapse, it was a financial crisis. The same in the 1970s or the collapse of the Bretton Woods system at the same time. I mean, both effects had an impact on the business cycle, but to say that this has an impact on the growth rate of the economy, I think this cannot be concluded. We should conclude rather that we should look at cross-country variations. Then we see uh, countries with relatively high carbon prices, uh, like Sweden, for example, and they have a relatively good development, and others with low carbon prices, they have a relatively bad development. So these are, you need time to adjust. You can go on different track, but it takes time to redirect uh, uh, economy. Then we go into growth theory, of course, associated new growth theory with, with uh, Romer, but actually there's an earlier paper by Suzuki in 1976, already had something like endogenous growth together with natural resource use. Very interesting to uh, take this reference. And then, of course, also we like to uh, quote John Hicks, because when we ever have, will be successful in climate policy, when we increase carbon prices, increase oil prices, we have to think about how much of additional innovation we can, we can induce. And of course, we always want to use very cautious assumptions. We never want to uh, be uh, overly optimistic. But this is an issue we have to carefully look at. How much innovation do we generate? What is about the resource efficiency potentials? And, uh, some of these potentials are huge. And how much do we gain in capital productivity? In general, when you look at this reshuffling of uh, economies on a new track, uh, on a greener track, say, uh, then you go into this general sustainability debate. Why are we not sustainable in general? Because we do not accumulate enough. Maybe not only physical capital, but also human capital and, and innovation and, and, and knowledge capital. So in the old days, it was said, well, we have increasing returns to capital. We have resource depletion, which makes it even more complicated. And we have increasing capital depreciation now because of climate change. So this makes it all very difficult to accumulate capital on the free market conditions. The solutions that were taken in earlier models were that we assume good input substitution. So let me just say, well, capital and resources, they are just good substitutes. Actually, this is not, not, really, a, not really a good uh, assumption, but I will come back to it. Or we assume some technical progress. Say, well, there is always some technical. We have some engineers. We have some smart people. Say, in France, you always have an engineering tradition, so something will come out there. So this will help us. Or we enforce in, 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 in sufficient savings. Say, OK, we have the half degree rule. We just need sufficient savings. Then this, this has to be invested, and this is how we can reach uh, uh, sustainability. Now, in the newer approaches, what I call newer macroeconomic approach, we do a little bit more than that. We say, well, everything that comes out of these things, which, are, well, which is crucial, should be endogenous, like capital formation, innovation, sectoral change also. We, we do lots of uh, multi-sector models. This has also, of course, an effect on, on the overall development. And then, of course, I mean, being a Toulouse, very clearly, we should include risk and uncertainty. And also things like non-linearity, we should uh, include momentum effects, and then we should integrate to other sustainability aspects, and we should provide an appropriate policy mix here. So I want to apply a little bit of growth theory to uh, make it a bit more concrete what I'm, what I'm doing here. So this is just basically the Keynes-Ramsey rule. If you have the parameters of interterminal uh, consumption uh, substitution of sigma, then you have a marginal return on broad capital here will be more uh, general than most models are. This is this capital pi. The depreciation rate d uh, is a d because it's actually endogenous in those models and the rate of impatience rho. Then we get uh, for consumption growth the usual Ken's Ramsey rule, which you can see here, and we can express it in, in uh, actually in, in total consumption or in per capita consumption. If you link the two, most people would say, OK, I know how this is going. I just add this population growth to the depreciation rate. This is what we should be doing. Actually, if you think it through, and not many people are aware of that, uh, there's different ways of including population growth here. Because it depends on whether you look at physical capital or knowledge capital. Physical capital is rival. Knowledge capital is non-rival. And actually, I will have a model in the end, and I will have, I have this here on the slide on, on the bottom, uh, where you can see that uh, population growth has an impact, a positive impact maybe, on, on the capital return, and no impact on the depreciation rate. So if, 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 capital, if, if knowledge is non-rival, you don't have to share the knowledge with others. Everybody can use the same knowledge, and then it's going a bit a different way. 
So uh, the graphical representation looks like this. So we have uh, the log of consumption. This is now per capita on the, horizontal, uh, the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And you can see, according to case Rems rule, how the economy is evolving over time. So we have a growth rate, C hat, which is given by the keynes ramsey rule, and we start with the initial consumption per capita. Now we can disentangle these impacts. We have a productivity effect, which is uh, uh, this pi over sigma, and we have the depreciation and, and, and impatience imp effect, which is subtracted. So you can subtract the red from the, uh, the, well, the green from the red, and you get the blue. So the difference between the two is our growth rate of the economy. And then we can do climate policy. We can do other things, and we can see our resource scarcity. We can do all kind of policy and see how this is affecting my picture here, the, how this is affecting the growth rate of the economy I'm looking at. So again, I have this uh, keynes rems rule. These are the determinants. And I know, of course, that this count rate, coverage of utility function, are crucial. But actually, in this talk, and also because others have worked substantially on these first two uh, issues, I want to focus more on the, on the capital return uh, to see uh, what, what does, uh, how does it look like in, in a multi-sector economy, basically. Then I want to look a bit at capital depreciation, how it's affected by climate change, and in the end I want uh, to talk about other issues like population growth. So marginal return on capital is capital pi. Usually in many models, say one sector models, people think about marginal product. That's fine, this is the, the capital lambda here. But actually, if you have different sectors, if you have capital goods which are different from output goods, for consumer goods, and I think this is the, normally should be the case, and actually here it's crucial, then I would have two prices, which is the PY and the PK, which I have to uh, make a difference. And then I also probably have capital losses and capital gains, so this is the delta PK. So in total, I have something like, uh, well, what is given here, I have a, a, well, a bit of a richer formula for the capital return, as, as you know, as a, to include this in the keynes Ramsey rule, it's, it's crucial what's going on there. So the higher this capital lambda is, the, of course, the higher is the growth rate, and the more sustainable I am, and then also have to find out what is the impact of policy on this thing. So in one sector model, the prices are the same, the prices are constant, then of course it's the same. But if I go to uh, multi-sector model, so the one sector model would ignore capital price levels, would also ignore capital price dynamics, and if you look into multi-sector models of uh, new growth theory, actually both are crucial. So what we want to stress here is that these prices are not the same. We have a capital goods sector producing machines and maybe also ideas. So all, all, all what is subsumed as a cumulative input, also education, this has a different production function than consumer goods. Then, of course, the growth rate can be different. And if you have many sectors, then we have many output prices and probably also have many capital stocks. So, if, well, in, in, in more elaborate CG models, we have many sectors. And in each sector, we have one capital good, which is accumulated. So we also do have many capital goods. And then we get growth effects whenever we have a price of capital which is decreasing, because if the capital price decreases, then you can accumulate, you can buy more capital goods, basically. So you have a constant effect through this, this knowledge spillovers, which were introduced by Paul Romer. So you, you assume that, in, 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 especially for knowledge and also for, well, Arrow had it also for, for capital investments that you learn by doing, and then you have a, a decreasing capital price. Whenever the capital price is decreasing, you can accumulate more capital stock and this helps your growth rate. Or we can have uh, structural effects, maybe when you do policy, if you probably uh, arrive to, to decrease the, 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 the price of a capital good relative to the output good, this is also something which helps your marginal return on capital. This helps the growth rate of the economy. <coughs> How is it related to the substitution? This is also, well, of course, an old topic in resource economics, uh, in the scoop der Hill. So if we have increasing resource prices, that was the question at the time, and we have, so we have resource depletion or climate policy nowadays, so which makes your fossil fuel prices increase. Then you would say, well, in one sector models, if you just uh, focus on one sector, you need something which is a good substitute, so the uh, capital pi is bounded from zero when resource and other inputs are substitutes. So uh, this is a problem, as I already said, because the empirical evidence is, is actually against it. So uh, what we're using in, in modern CG models, in these numerical simulation models, what I told you, usually we use uh, an assistive substitution which are below unity. So it's not what we would, use, uh, would have here. But uh, luckily, this is only one effect that we have here. If you go to multi-sector models, we will have another effect. So I call this the demand side effect. And what is the supply side effect? Well. 
Actually, you can show if you have a consumer of the capital goods sector with two different prices, as I had it with the PY and the PK, then this capital return is bounded from below when inputs are complements, not substitutes. And what happens in those models is that uh, the inputs are driven out of the consumer sector into the capital goods sector. So say you're decreasing your fossil fuel input in the output sector, you have another input like labor, which is driven out and goes into the capital accumulation, then you have more capital accumulation, especially also in the research lab, you need labor, and then you have the supply side effect. Here's a little example how it would look like. So this is a, a capital resource economy, very simple. So output Y depends on capital stock K and uh, exhaustible resource R, and I have production elasticity uh, theta K and one minus theta K. Now, if I take uh, the marginal return on capital, this is what you see here, and I know over time that this, oh, no, this was too fast. So this, this term here is decreasing because resources are decreasing over resource use is decreasing over time according to the hoteling rule. Capital is accumulated, so this is decreasing. If nothing else happened, like in the Cobb Douglas production function, then you're lost. This marginal return will decrease, and of course, your growth rate will be going uh, to zero and even be negative in the long run. So, this is the scoop the heel result. But if you have another effect, if actually, if this is a, assume a CS function and you have an increasing uh, share of capital, so these are instantaneous elasticities in this case, then you might have a relief here. Uh, if the, uh, theta k over time is increasing, then of course, you might also be able to sustain your economy. So these are the demand side effects of the scoop the hill. On the other hand, in, in the, in the uh, multi-sector model, as I just explained, if capital prices decrease, you have another channel, which is actually more effective, so that the, the supply side effect, which makes your capital goods cheaper uh, relative to consumer goods, which attracts then, uh, uh, well, inputs to produce more capital goods and more machinery. So it can be shown that in multi-sector model, if you are actually out of this uh, input substitution, it's more about sectoral substitution. So, and then we say, well, all these sectors have, a, of course, every sector has capital resources as an input, and the, the relative size, actually, of this uh, substitution else, this is matter here. So we can have a, a sustainable economy where in all sectors we have poor input substitution, but we will have a sectoral redirection of inputs, and we have to check which sector is surviving. And actually, there is a good case, this is a good equilibrium, where in during transition, we even have an increasing growth rate, and we, we go in the long run to a constant growth rate as, as in, a, in a normal economy. This is the case when the inputs are redirected to dynamic sectors, what we call also high-tech sectors. It's also when we produce computers and whatever we have out here, Star Trek and net smart grids, whatever, when we end up there, then we are in a good equilibrium. On the other hand, we can also have a bad equilibrium if the, if the inputs are attracted, say, for, for, beer, for beer production, then of course we can drink, uh, well, we can, we can produce lots of beer, we drink at our beer, but this is not innovative in the end, and then we have no innovation and the beer is gone, and in the end we will have zero consumption. So by this sectoral change, it depends where the, same, well, well, where the inputs are directed, and this gives you then the nature of the long-run equilibrium. Now, let me talk about another topic, because I've now focused on this marginal return uh, capital, which is crucial, and I think, uh, well, it, it, there we had to clarify some things. On the other hand, about climate change, also the theoretical models of climate change, what should we do? Well, actually, of course, it's stock pollution we are accumulating. We should still look at capital accumulation, because it's a long-run process. And what is this climate change doing? Well, it is harming capital stock. Some people put it in the utility function, some people say it's, well, just temporarily the productivity slow down, but I think it's, this is why I put these pictures here. You would argue if, if it looks like this, if you have some weather shocks, then your capital is partly destroyed. And the, 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 uh, the main issue being here, the result being here, that is not uh, from one period to the next, you, you can fix that. You need some savings, you need some investment to rebuild your capital stock, and this takes some more years. And especially in, in poorer economies like in Pakistan or in, in the Philippines, if you, if you have this, uh, uh, this massive uh, destruction of capital, it, it takes you decades until you have to build this up. Now, what's the consequence of that? Well, if you see it in the picture, it's not the capital return which is affected, but it's the depreciation rate. And of course, if you take it as a difference here between the red and the green, you see here, uh, if it starts with climate change here, then you will have uh, maybe a stagnant economy, maybe your growth rate is lower, or maybe your growth rate will even be negative, because you can build some capital, but more capital is destroyed because you're vulnerable to climate change, and then in the long run, you will not be able to sustain your growth rate. It can even be worse. It could be that we'll have a poverty trap, 
So this is a picture about, well, a nonlinear uh, relationship, but this is now reversed to what you usually used to look at. Usually we have some kind of, of uh, well, a production function looks like this, and straight depreciation here is the opposite. So if, if you're very poor and vulnerable, you will have very high depreciation in the beginning. And then, of course, if, if you're not able to, to get over this uh, equilibrium, which is unstable, then you will always be stuck here. So you can always produce a little bit of capital, but you will always be, again, uh, well, you have, you have a, your the strike of, of, of the capital uh, destruction of capital change, which, which brings you back to the origin. So this is a new kind of a poverty trap which can emerge uh, with climate change if you don't do anything about it. Then we should look at the lags that we have. Of course, these things uh, do not come, so we have long-run uh, issues everywhere. The lags, which are, uh, of course, between burning fossil fuels and then the temperature and the impact of the temperature on the capital stock. And maybe a bit less severe than what we have here, so less severe than this poverty trap, which is really a drastic, uh, well, uh, well if, if you think about the north-south context, a drastic conclusion. We can also talk about delayed income uh, convergence, and this would look like this. You would have first a normal development, then climate change is starting, and you see the rich economy is not affected, the poor economy will be affected, so you will have a higher depreciation. And then, of course, first you had some kind of a convergence, because this growth rate is higher than this, and then maybe this economy, the poor economy, will come into a stagnation. Well, the rich economy can still grow, and then you would have uh, no longer convergence. The uh, living standards would not uh, converge on an international level. Uncertainty is another thing, uh, which also is still in the efficiency. Now, we have so many uncertainties. We always do. But here, because it's long run, and because the damages are expected in 50, 100 years from now, the, the, the big damages, so the economy, what, what will it be then? Uh, what about the ecology? What about policy making is the biggest source of uncertainty uh, anyway. So in terms of climate shocks, we don't know what is the size, what is the kind, the arrival, the frequency of these shocks, of these disasters. We can think about smaller shocks or bigger shocks. So we can talk about recurring events or tipping points. Uh, the literature has focused a lot on tipping points. Um, this is come, well, this comes from ecology. Uh, people think about, you know, if you have a species like the polar bear and you have some climate change and this species is, is vanishing, is disappearing, then of course this is a tipping point. It's never coming back. What's a tipping point in, in terms of the world economy? Well, you would say uh, we lose 100% of GDP. But actually, this is not what people usually assume. They say, well, it's maybe 30% of GDP or 20%, which is a big shock, of course. It's a big shock if it comes all the same. One wonders if this is really working. But then you have also to think about well, what's after this. Uh, well, if, if you only have 20, if you still have 80% of your capital stock, so what's the development after that? So that is not really clear. So we, we tend to think in, in terms of, uh, of, of recurring events, maybe 1% of the world GDP, which is already a big disaster. If you think about, well, 1%. Worldwide, this would be a big climate shock. And then it's recurring, and you have to, uh, to build your capital again. And then for such cases, you can, in closed form solution, you can derive what's optimum growth and then what's optimum abatement in the end. That's what we should know. So this is the picture when you have these climate shocks, these recurring events. So this is the Keynes-Ramsey rule in this case. So this is enlarged productivity. Uh, here we have capital uh, omega, but we have this uh, pollution intensity and we have abatement efficiency. And here we, we model the climate shocks as a Poisson process. So this is the Poisson arrival rate, the lambda. And you see whenever it strikes, then you have a depreciation of capital and you're jumping down here. And then your growth rate, of course, you have this discontinuity. You always uh, go back uh, and you have a different uh, kind of a growth rate and you have a different growth development uh, as uh, well if you, if, you, uh, if you compare it to expected growth rate, which you usually do if you don't have these climate shocks. But importantly, what follows from such thing, of course, we can derive optimal growth rate, optimal savings, but what's most important is optimal abatement in such a case. And the optimal abatement would look like, well, in case of uncertainty, we use uh, more stringent climate policies. And this is what I would call, what I had in the beginning, this is rational approach. I mean, what, what are people, this is also now from climate location, if people are too uncertain, they get stuck. They get kind of uncertain about everything. So they, they even start to think about, well, I'm not sure if there is even climate change. So they're, they're completely fundamentally uncertain. And that's not a rational, a rational way to deal with things. On the other hand, if you think about what people do when there's a real shock coming, like the bird flu or the swine flu, 
people invest like hell in some things which are completely useless. So they overreact. Once it's uh, at the door, if, if you see it coming, if the shock is coming, then you would do a crazy thing. So the, again, uh, these two things are not really what you should do if you just cool calculate what is optimal uh, for, your, uh, for your economy. But this is really difficult messages that you have to convey to policymakers. So we can uh, derive how the optimal abatement should behave. It's uh, increasing the arrival rate, total factor productivity, pollution, uh, everything what you would have. And then, of course, you can do the theoretical result. You can plug in some numbers, and you can also derive what the, uh, the price, the optimum price of a ton of carbon should be, and what exactly what the target should be of policy. Now I want to change gears. I don't know how much time I still have. I'm a bit confused, but you will make me sign. Five minutes. Okay, good. So. Blah. I was addressing equity issues in five minutes. Let's see how good. It's important because, in general, when you think about sustainability, what you want is you want to avoid an unequal treatment of your children and grandchildren. That's what you basically aim at because we will basically, we will, we will can live with the climate shocks. They will be more intensive in, in, in later generations. And with climate policy, this is really a big issue for equity. I mean, let's talk with Piketty or who else is now strictly concerned about inequalities. Climate policy is really a big, big thing. Because if you don't do climate policy, as we have seen it, the poor countries, the vulnerable countries will suffer disproportionately. They will be thrown back all the, all the way. <coughs> and if you do climate policy, this is what the rich countries care about, well, then they will have to carry some cost of climate policy, of course. We were polluting in the past, and we still pollute quite substantially, so we have to change our behavior, we have to change the policy. It doesn't come without the cost. The cost is lower than people usually think, because we, we have these dynamic effects, but still, it's not that the cost is zero. And also, I mean, when you look at these climate policies, um, we should think about, if, not only about the poor in the future, we also should think about the poor in the uh, present generation, so we should be, I mean, when you think about ethics, we should be universal. And it's actually true that people argue a lot in terms of inequality. So we should uh, look at how is the uh, impact of carbon price on the income distribution. And in many countries, actually, it's, it's, it's uh, actually a progressive uh, effect in, in emerging countries and in poor countries. This is actually working the, in the right direction. In the other countries where you suspect that you have a regressive uh, effect, you can always re well, redesign the whole tax system in a way that it will be progressive in the end, if you want to do this, of course. Now, if it's about the redistribution, can we then dismiss the whole climate policy and just give financial aid to those who need it? First of all, let's say we need an overall climate agreement. The Kyoto Protocol was a failure because it divided the world. We don't want to have this anymore. But we have to think about these differences. We have to address the inequalities. We have to address uh, the heterogeneous world. So when we think that the lower developed countries should also do some climate policy, this is my second bullet here, they call it the right to development. I had a long time to understand what this UN, uh, well, this, this sentence could mean in economic terms. But I think it means if we force them to do some climate policy, we can also give them some aid. We should aid them, well, we should help them in terms of technicalities, in terms of capital. We should support mitigation. But it's not that we should dismiss climate policy. We just help those who don't have the means to do good climate policy. But this basic asymmetry that we have, that the, the South is vulnerable and will suffer and the North will have a costly uh, policy to do, some people saw now, well, we can solve this by just giving some aid to the, to the poor countries and then uh, this will be equally good. And actually, this is, uh, turns out not to be correct. So we have this model where we compare these two policies. And this is actually, so it's a North-South model and we compared it for these two uh, blocks, North and South. So you can see M for mitigation, D for development. So this is the M. So you start here, and then you start to give, uh, either you do mitigation policy or you start to give aid. So the North has to pay. Actually, it turns out in equilibrium that the North is more productive. So actually, this is starting higher. But the, uh, if you think about this capital destruction thing I told you, it's a growth effect. If you do mitigation, you will have a higher growth rate afterwards because the North is polluting, and then we will have a higher growth rate. So in, in both cases, the North is better off if it does mitigation than in, in case of giving aid. Uh, unless you think that financial aid can buy growth, but this is relatively clear from the literature. Here, we are relatively uh, well on the same growth rate. 
Now, this is for the south. The south has two cases in our model. Either you get a little bit more in the beginning when, you give, uh, when you're aided financially, but still you will have a growth effect, and here the growth effect is, is uh, already higher from the beginning. So also for the south, I mean, when you plug in normal numbers, you will be better off if you do climate, change, uh, climate policy instead of doing um, just a redistribution of income. So there's no good substitute for climate policy. You just can supplement climate policy with redistribution, and actually you would have to do. So as I'm running out of time, I got this very well, uh, I have to do something which uh, may say, may, maybe is interesting to you, because this, the real uh, distribution issue is about how can we distribute this current budget. So we have something uh, like a new budget, something which is worth that we have to allocate it to the different countries. And let's just jump in one device that we have developed at ETH. So uh, usually now, I cannot tell the story about Le Petit Prince, but that's not usual. Uh, you know, we are all concerned about this procedure. I'm very well. But, so this is the pledge. All the countries are now doing their pledges, and there should be a review. The question is, what kind of a review <coughs> are we expecting? And actually, this is why we did this here. We did a climate calculator. It's now, it's a beta version, but it's working better and better. So what you want to do is to see, okay, you have some climate... Uh, you have some equity principles, some generally acceptable equity, like, like the willingness, like the ability to pay, like the merit principle, like things that you generally observe in tax policies. And then you can calculate fair and, contrib uh, and, and equitable contributions, and you can see where the countries are relative to those. So I invite you to check this out if you have time, then you go to ccalc.ch, and then you can see how these INDCs compare to these uh, budgets uh, that we have calculated. And of course, we have different kind of equity principles they're using, but if you see that a country is always below, I mean, if, if you take any equity principle, any, any criteria that you would think they are very useful, and some countries are pledges uh, are, are too low, then of course you, this might be an indication that it's really a problem there. So then, unfortunately, I have to close down, but I come to my last slide because it was already alluded to, so I have more stuff. This is actually a book you can also download freely from my webpage if you like. But my conclusion, as I came back with my proposition, just to remind you, I think we should look at growth dividends, we should look at the burden sharing, we should include the uncertainties, and of course we should remain focused. And what will help in the end is when we have some momentum effects, if we have some uh, uh, expectations that go in the right direction. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention.